Welcome to another episode of Real People, Real Stories, where we provide you with compelling tales from everyday people just like you. I'm your host, John Wendell Adams, author of the novels Betrayal and Payback, along with the soon-to-be-released novel, Ruthless. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com. So for the next 23 minutes, let's get to today's guest. The first thing I'm going to do when I try to resolve a conflict, and Diane's going to do, is we're going to try to hear from God. He's not going to tell me one resolution and her something different. Hey, Mike. Good to see you, brother. Oh, it's great to see you. Yeah, thanks for coming and hanging out with me. Yeah, my pleasure. Looking yeah, forward to it. Yep, me too, man. I've been counting the days till you and I had an opportunity to come hang out together. So this is, uh, this is going to be great for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what I wanted to do, first of all, is just, I know you, but you know, if you would please just sure. spend a minute and just who you are, your name, right? What part of the country you live in and really what you do. Mike Siri um, is my name and uh, my wife, Diane and I, and our Two daughters, their husbands, our four soon to be five grandkids. We all live in the Wakanda, Illinois area, which is uh, about 40 miles northwest of Chicago. I was born in Indiana in a little town called Mishawaka and grew up there with two sisters and great parents and um, ended up here after college. So I've been here ever since. I spent 20 some years in the corporate world and then uh, really left that because I just was challenged to focus more on living a life of significance versus a life of success. Mm. And through the whole journey of that really ended up with Diane who had uh, begun a counseling career or a second career, if you will, after raising um, two beautiful daughters, we co-founded what's called the relationship center here in Wakanda. She continues her counseling practice out of here. And I continue to minister out of here. We do a lot of marriage work, which has become uh, our passion, certainly. Right. So that's how we spend most of our week, if you will, either either ministering to other people focused on relationship or um, just enjoying the relationships that we have been blessed with with our family. Well, thanks for that, Mike. But um, tell me, just if you would, how long have you and Diane been married? We've been married uh, a little over 42 years. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's a real testament. What I want to ask you is, as you were describing to me, you had a conversation with your wife regarding your marriage and you as a husband. Tell me about that. What was that like? I'm not sure how much of a conversation it was a, a, as a kind of a reminder by Diane uh, of something, but <clears throat> we had probably been married 30 plus years at the time. And I would say that we had up until that time, we had a really good marriage and something kind of, um, I think hit Diane one day and she just said, we're in trouble. I kind of looked at her. I think at that point we had already started the relationship center and we're, we're counseling and doing those things. And it just seemed like that doesn't make sense that we're in trouble or we've got a really good marriage. She said it a second time, a few weeks later, and then a third time. And I finally got it. And I just went into a time of prayer and reflection on that. What does she mean? And basically understood that I had become content with a really good marriage. And God was saying to me, I didn't create really good. And he created the, what we've kind of coined um, the idea of an epic marriage. And that's something that's you know beyond great. What does that look like? And so that just put me and really us um, on a whole new direction for our marriage and um, just substantially increased the reward and benefit of our marriage. Got it. Well, I appreciate that. So uh, really, Diane's question was foundational, if you will, in terms of kind of the rest of the story. And I guess Definitely. when I think about what it is that you indicated, there's probably a lot of men a lot of marriages, a lot of women who are saying, hey, you know, our marriage is pretty good. You know, we go on vacation, we do things, we have a family and et cetera. But I, I think based on what it is that I, I heard from you, it was really quite different in terms of what uh, Diane said, repeated, what you heard, right. and then your reflection associated with that. What's different today? You as a husband, what's different today than 
was previous to those uh, comments of Diane's in your reflection? The biggest thing would have to be what the focus is of our life. Uh, understanding that there's nothing more important in our life, no relationship in our life other than God, of course, than our marriage. And was I really pursuing that um, to the degree that I could? And a lot of this came, John, from uh, really understanding and knowing and growing in my knowledge of, of God and relationship with God and understanding who he is and who he is really in this sense as the creator and understanding that he created this amazing relationship called marriage. And he has a, he has a design and a plan for that. And there's also a reward for that. And that reward is, is joy. And scripture talks about the joy of the master, the joy of the creator. Right. That joy is available to all of us, right? But there's a, if you will, there's a requirement on our part in order to, I don't want to say achieve that because it's something he gives us, but in order to attain that, if you will. And I think that that's it, is that it's, it's an understanding of what his design is and then making a commitment and committing, submitting to him, if you will, to live into that design. And, and a lot of guys, maybe not a lot of women would appreciate this, but if you know what a chop saw is as a carpenter, you know, it's, you basically take a saw and you just pull it down and cut the wood that's there. Well, I can use a chop saw to trim my fingernails. Sure. Right. But it's going to be damaging if I do. I can also take fingernail clippers and try to cut wood and it's going to take me forever. Sure. The idea behind that is that why do we try to recreate what the creator created, the amazing creator created, and make marriage better from the perspective that we have? It's kind of like using the wrong tool for the wrong job. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's an important part of, of our journey in, in pursuing and understanding what God created for us. I mean, if you compare and contrast your relationship and you as a husband previously to a lot of the things that you've embraced today, how would you compare and contrast that? And maybe that's your scenario about the chop saw and the fingernail clipper. But if you had an opportunity to say to a guy today and say, hey, look, here's Mike Siri as a contented husband, and here's Mike Siri today, how would you compare and contrast that? I think the biggest thing in that is rearranging the priorities of my life, of our life, if you right. will. Right, right. had an amazing mentor and pastor who um, until a few months ago passed away but one of the things that he taught me and taught everybody well was that kind of the statement that if it's not good for the marriage it's not good for either one of you sure and i think we've grasped onto that i know i know we try most days to grasp onto that and simply what that means is that if i don't look to our marriage first and if i don't believe that if it's best for our marriage it's best for me then I'm right. going to start making selfish decisions. Sure. Decisions that may, I think, wrongly um, assume are going to create joy and happiness in my life. But the truth is it's going to be short-term happiness and it's going to probably be hurtful or devastating to other people, especially Diane. Got it. You shared with me something. I actually had to write it down and really focus on it. Uh, you said something that for me was pretty... Uh, revolutionary. And that was about this word and this concept of compromise. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Unpack that just for a bit, because I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, uh, Mike, and I'd, I'd appreciate you uh, sharing that. Sure. Yeah. And it's interesting because if we look at that word compromise, and if I look back in my corporate career and some of my board work and things that I did, uh, it often revolved around compromise in order to get to a decision and to get to get to a solution on something. Right. That doesn't work in marriage. We, we talk about it. We, we practice this in our marriage. We teach this to other couples as well, is that we can all agree that giving in, one person giving in or controlling the other is, is, is not good. Some people would say that's win-lose, but the truth is that's lose-lose. Even the person that's winning is losing in that regard. Right. We say, this, we say the same thing about compromise. Compromise is lose-lose. 
I think in, in, in some places it's, it's required. If you ask most couples, you know, is, is compromise important in your marriage? They would say, absolutely. I would say, absolutely not. It is, it is lose, lose. And what do I mean by that? If, if you think about what compromise means, it means that I am giving up something in order to get something. Yes. Right. That is focused on me and what I want. I will walk away from that happy that I got what I wanted, but eventually I will get back to the place of being bitter about what I had to give up. Right. Right. And bitterness, I think, is what actually causes divorce. It's not finances or communication or sex issues or whatever. It's the bitterness that comes out of struggling through those situations. Right. So we right. a conflict resolution model that is involved with two, it contains two goals. And those goals are first agreement and second intimacy. Mm. So those have to be your primary goals and focus when you go into a time of trying to resolve a conflict. And again, understand that conflict is not bad. Right. Jerry Smalley basically says conflict maybe is the fastest way to get to intimacy. Got it. Because if you work through conflict, if you do it effectively, you will get to a greater level of intimacy. Got it. Right? Now, right. I would say that you can get to agreement without getting to intimacy. Sure. You can't get to intimacy without first getting to agreement. Ooh, I like that. I right. like that. And, you know, the thing that I think that somehow ties together with the thing that you said just previous to my question about if it's not good for the marriage, it's right. not good for you. If it's not good for the marriage, it's Absolutely. not good for, for, in this case, Diane. Right. Absolutely. So, right. yeah, it's, it sounds like that is tantamount to this whole thing of uh, intimacy Absolutely. conflict. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, again, we need to understand that if it's not good for the marriage really means if it's not good for what God created and designed for us, then it's not good for either one of us. And I've okay. stepped into a covenant relationship. I've given up my rights, basically, to live my life for my pleasure, right? And Diane, the same. And we've committed to living our lives for our pleasure, whatever that looks like. But here's the thing that's important to understand in conflict resolution. If we are centered on God, it's like the first thing I'm going to do when I try to resolve a conflict and Diane's going to do is we're going to try to hear from God. Sure. Is this my problem? Is this our problem, our conflict? <laughs> Am I looking at it from my perspective? Our pers what does it look like? And, and if I totally am listening to God and Diane is totally listening to God, he's not going to tell me one thing, one, one resolution and her something different. So we're going to come back together, right? And we're going to yeah. say, God, I heard this from God. And she's going to say, I heard this, God. And it's like, that was pretty simple. But on the other hand, if we come back together, it's like, you know, I heard, no, I heard this. It's like, okay, which one of us or maybe both of us is not really hearing God. He's not going to tell her something and me something different. I think that's important to understand in who our God is in this relationship. Yeah, I so appreciate this thing of intimacy, because even in the words that you've spoken just now about you hearing from God, Diane hearing from God, right. really then trying to work through whatever that conflict is, not from the standpoint of what I gain or what she gains, it's really what God would want for us along this continuum of marriage. Right. And what does God want for, for us in this? He wants us to have fullness of joy in this sure. relationship yeah that's yeah. what i want you know yeah. and 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 i think the hardest the biggest hurdle for couples often is to get to that place of of believing that that there is fullness of joy in this marriage relationship if they simply submit themselves and their marriage to god and live it according to his design and not their own kind of like well why would i do the work because it is it is work why would I do the work? It's work, but not toil. I want to, I want to add that. Why would I do the work if I don't see the reward or the benefit of doing the work? So right. I first believe that God's design results in ultimate joy. And, you know, I didn't believe that. I took that on faith when we started this thing, but I can sit here today and say, that is absolutely true. There is, there is fullness of joy in my life, in our marriage, because of, of, of everything that has really been birthed out of our marriage and our relationship. 
just hearing you say that, I mean, the comment that you made was the fullness of joy. I had to kind of take that on faith. And I think for a lot of guys, I mean, we have this, this thing planted in our head. Hey, you know what? I'm the king of this castle. I'm the one who makes the decisions. It's right. my way. Here's what we're supposed to do. And I think you're saying something quite different. I mean, there's that expression of, you know, when you break down the word intimacy, it's into me see. Absolutely. And, I, and I think that what, what the aim is, this thing of joy, the fullness of joy, I think for many guys, when you talk about this thing about being the husband that they need to be, there is some truth to taking it on faith and just seeing it as you go down the road. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, again, we need to understand that God created us for intimacy. That, he wants that, he, he offers that for all of us. Yeah, sure. Right, yeah. and, and we, we kind of teach a, an order, if you will, to intimacy because intimacy requires, for two people to be totally intimate, it requires total authenticity, total vulnerability on the part of mm. both people. Mm. Right. And here's the thing. We wrestled with this quite a while before we created our mission statement for the Relationship Center. But we believe the correct order of that is intimacy with self before intimacy with God, before intimacy with each other. Wow. Why do I why is that important to understand? Because here's the thing. If I don't know myself and if I'm not willing to look at who I am and look at all the wounds and why I've become who I've become, all my strengths and how those impact other people, how to use those. Right. Excuse me. I can't sit down in my morning quiet time with God and, and be totally authentic. If I can't be totally authentic when I show up to meet with God, well, there's not intimacy. He's going to be totally authentic, right? I don't ever have to worry about that. Sure. So it's always my, <laughs> my issue if there's no intimacy with God. Got it. Here's the other thing. It's like if I don't create intimacy with God, I can't understand God and God's design and I can't live it out with the person that I'm supposed to be living that out with, who I've committed to live that out with. There are so many gems in all of what it is that we're really talking about. I guess what I want to do is uh, I want to dial back to what really the transformation subsequent to the question that Diane asked. And it's that after this transformation, what would you say is um, in addition to the other things that you've indicated, what would you say are some of the greatest changes, right, for your marriage? And the real reason why I ask that question is because there are guys that will hear this and go, okay, so what's in it for me? I mean, what's the end game? You know, what's the benefit for me, right? right, right, right. But just, just talk about the, the transformation, really, that's transpired as a result of those questions she asked. For any guy who's not living as an, what I would call an epic husband or trying to be an epic husband, they're going to have a hard time hearing this because the work that I had to do, John, was the self intimacy piece. Ah. That's where I really had to focus a lot of my time before we could get to that place of really um, having what, what I most days would call an epic marriage. But it's, it's realizing that in order for me to live out my time as a husband, as an epic husband, I had to first understand who I am and to listen to my helper, which Diane is designed to be, not so that I would change to benefit her, but that I would become more like who God created me to be. And I had to listen to her. I had to set aside my pride and understand who I had become as a man, as a man of God, as a husband, as a father, and in that, I had to begin to understand where does some of that come from? Yeah. Why do I do some of the things that I do? Yeah. And it required me to go back and look at, you know, a lot of my generational wounds, maybe from a father or mother, from maybe a teacher or a pastor or, or, or whatever those, and the decisions that I had made that had caused me to go down a different path than I should be going down. Got it. And, and it's not just looking and understanding those, it's it's basically agreeing, it's being convicted and agreeing to let God, God the refiner, do what God needed to do in order to change me, right? And we yeah. talk about, you know, awareness, conviction, refinement, and the understanding that, well, I'm aware that I'm not living totally as an epic husband, 
Um, God is a refiner. I know that. It talks about that in Malachi. But, but the conviction piece says that I also understand God will not come in and refine me without my permission. That's the free. Right, right. right. And the right. conviction is often hard to get to for a lot of guys. I think that's where we struggle. It's like conviction means I'm giving up control. But also, if you understand, for example, the refiner of silver, as it talks about Malachi, well, I'm agreeing basically for God to put me, my the raw metal, if you will, on the hottest part of the fire Oof. in order to burn out the impurities. Well, that's not going to be fun. Oof. But until we come out the other side and do that enough times and recognize that, that there is such great benefit in that, right. we're always going to have to operate in that place where we have to get broken enough. We have to hurt enough in order to be convicted as opposed to, I want to learn enough. I've become a lifelong learner, really, of who I am and how that impacts us. But in that whole process, who God created me to be. Got it. Got it. Right? Well, uh, Mike, that, that's really powerful. I, I would ask you this question. Uh, if we, if I had to, an opportunity to ask about that transformation and to Diane or others um, who are in your life, your children, your friends, yeah. uh, other family members, what do you think they'd say about the, the transition of, of Mike Siri? Sure. Yeah, interesting. I can think of a situation where recently I, I noticed that there was a, a new decorative apple sitting on you know a coffee table in our house. And I went to Diane and I asked the question. I said, did you go out looking for an apple for that place or did you see an apple in the store and thought it would look good in that place? And it's like, I think before I would have been like, why did you spend money on that apple? Right. And now I want to know, how does your mind work? Because that's fascinating for me, how her mind works. Again, it's, it's a matter of getting outside of myself and understanding and learning her. Because if I understand her, if I learn more about her, I'm better able to serve her. Got it. And here's another thing that I think is, is, is critical in that aspect. It's like there's this concept that I think God just hit me with one day. And it's like, if something needs to be done like around the house or, or whatever, there's no reason why I can't do it. Oof. As opposed Oof. to, well, Diane can do that or the kids, whatever that may be. And right. certainly it's, you know, that, that takes communication and, and understanding because there's, uh, for example, I'm not very good at ironing and right. Diane actually enjoys ironing. So I'm going to let her do the ironing, right? But it's just more of a mindset of why wouldn't, I do it. Why can't I do that? Why would I rely on her to do it? Right. right. Well, and I know that you would probably spend, there's a whole commentary around this thing of service uh, in a relationship, in a marriage. And so, right. I mean, you're starting down that path and I, that's, that's a beautiful thing. You know, what's really interesting to me is, Mike, I'm going <laughs> to invariably ask you to come back because there's so many jewels in the things that you've communicated and we could go far deeper associated with any of the, uh, the aspects of it. Right. But as we come to our, the end of our time together, there is a question that I want to ask you. If you had an opportunity to talk to others, and I'm saying guys as well as women, people that are married, those people that maybe are thinking about marriage, uh, people that have been married before, maybe divorced, et cetera, if you had an opportunity to communicate something to them in terms of a final statement, what do you think that'd be? <laughs> How much time? Yes. Do you have? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I'm officiating at a wedding this weekend. I've been preparing. What do I want to say hmm. and do it in a short period of time? It's like there are so many things. And, and for, for this couple, and, and I think it's true for all of us, the, just the visual of a merry-go-round came to mind. Not, not the kind that you see in an amusement park with the horses going up and down, but the kind you would see on a playground where, you know, people sit on it or whatever and hang on with dear life and another person runs around pushing the thing and tries to jump on it. it. That kind of concept. And I think oftentimes we start off our marriage as two people, if you will, hanging on desperately at the outs, outer edges of that merry-go-round as it's spinning faster and faster because of all the demands of the world. Right. But here's the thing. We're, sep we're on the same merry-go-round, but we're very separated, right, in that regard. 
Right. But as we move closer and closer and closer to the center of that merry-go-round, we become closer and closer to each other. Ooh. And it doesn't seem like it's spinning quite so fast. But here's, mm. here's the beauty in all of this. In marriage, as God designed it, as we move closer and closer to the center, we're growing in intimacy with each other, but we also are getting closer and closer to him and growing in intimacy with him. And as we get closer and closer in intimacy with him, we're getting closer and closer in intimacy with each other. Wow. And when wow. we stand in the center, united with each other, arms around each other, you know, arms around his arms around us, if you will, it barely feels like that merry-go-round is spinning. We are solid, we are connected, we are holding each other up. And it's just, this is, it's, you know, again, I'll go back and say, it, 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 we say it's a lot of work, right? But it's easy when sure. you know what you are working towards. Sure. I think that's sure. the thing. When, when Diane and I get into the center of that merry-go-round and hang on to each other, God's arms around us, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's just joyful. It's fullness of joy. Yeah, I love that's that that's comment. Available. That's available to all of us. Right. Yeah. Well, first of all, I love the analogy. But I just come back to if there's one expression you've communicated, it's this thing of fullness of joy. And uh, if, you know, we asked, I don't know, 100 different men or 100 different women in or out of relationship, that probably would be a consistent comment is this desire to have fullness of joy. Right. Right. Mike, Mike, I have to tell you, man, I've really enjoyed <laughs> Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. God has just given me a passion and a blessing for marriage, not just sure. mine, but for you know other people's as well. And to be able to do that and share that and work with couples, I you know, it's just it's it's fast, fasc it's fabulous, fascinating, and fabulous. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. coming and spending time with us. And I can tell you, as as I'm sitting here that uh, I will want to have you come back. Uh, yeah, so thank you again, Mike, for yeah. take, taking the time. My pleasure. All right, well, you, you, yeah, you have a great day and, uh, and we'll talk soon. All right, thanks. All right.